Welcome to this Constitutional Commission meeting uh, on the role of broadcasting in, in Scotland. Um, we have a, 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 an excellent panel tonight. Now, a few words, if I may, about the Constitutional Commission, who we are. Uh, there are some details on the display panels uh, at the back of the, the room, but if I can just say a few words. Um, we're an independent, non-partisan uh, Scottish think tank research uh, and education charity. Uh, you'll notice there's a little box outside for donations, and that's because we're a charity. Thank you very much. Uh, our aims are to promote the development of education, citizenship, community development, through a better understanding of constitutional uh, matters, structures, and processes. And that's just a long-winded way of saying that uh, in this island, uh, we operate under the aegis of an unwritten constitution. Uh, why is that remarkable? Well, it's remarkable because there are only uh, two other countries in the world, aside from the UK, who operate on the basis of an unwritten constitution. <coughs> Israel and New Zealand. And we have one other remarkable uh, element to our constitution, and that is that uh, it allows clerics to make laws. There is only one other country in the world which permits clerics to make laws. That's right, Iran. Uh, so the UK is in very good company there. Um, let me uh, just say a few words about uh, our president. Uh, the president of the Constitutional Commission is Canon Kenyon Wright. Uh, Kenyon um, helps to preserve the continuity uh, going way back to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, and the commission um, came about because Kenyon felt that he wanted to make a, an additional contribution. Kenyon is now based in Stratford-on-Avon, uh, and this was, it seemed to us, uh, pretty much the best way of tapping into his talents, and at the same time, um, making it possible for him to make that, that contribution. And he's very, very active. Uh, he he uh, uh, is um, studying the Scottish media pretty much 24-7, uh, and I've yet to come across any uh, constitutional-related subject upon which Kenyon does not have a very, very strong view. So he's with us uh, in, in spirit, at least. Um, and one of the products, if I can just end this section with a plug, um, one of the products of the Constitutional Commission is this very worthwhile book by Elliot Bulmer, uh, who's our research director, who unfortunately can't be here tonight uh, because somebody at Oxford University uh, wants to speak to him uh, tomorrow, so he needs to travel. But it's all blushes aside. He's very, it's a very, very good production. And Alex, who I mentioned earlier, has multiple copies of this estimable tome. So anyone who wishes to part with £10, Alex would be more than happy uh, to uh, reciprocate by giving you a copy of this, uh, this, this book. Um, it's mentioned, by the way, for those of you who read the Sunday Herald, it's mentioned in uh, this extract, uh, which is entitled, uh, from Sunday's Glasgow Herald, Do Scots Need the Lords? Not the Lord, the Lords. And, and, and it's, a, it's an attempt to look at the place of the House of Lords. Uh, and the latest attempts to reform that, uh, that institution. The role of broadcasting in Scotland. We have an absolutely wonderful uh, group of panellists tonight. Uh, and let me just spend a couple of seconds, if I may, though you may recognise everyone uh, here, just take a couple of seconds just to uh, say a few words about each of our panellists. Uh, Ian McWhirter on my right is an award-winning political commentator who has worked both at Westminster and Holyrood for more than 20 years, uh, presenting major BBC news programmes uh, such as Holyrood Live and Politics Scotland. And he played a key role in forming the Sunday Herald in 1999. And Ian currently writes for the Sunday Herald. And in fact, uh, the two contributions that I particularly liked in the Sunday Herald this weekend are Ian's and Elliot's. Uh, the Scotsman and The Guardian, and he was also rector of Edinburgh University between 2009 and 2012. Welcome, Ian. Professor Tom Devine, 
is Senior Research Professor in History at the University of Edinburgh and Director of the Scottish Centre for Diaspora Studies. Arguably the most distinguished and well-known historian in Scotland, he has published 32 books, 32, including The Scottish Nation, which at the time outsold the Harry Potter series, I'm told. <laughs> for only two weeks, for only two weeks. <laughs> and the most recent, which is To the Ends of the Earth, Scotland's Global Diaspora. Tom is the face and voice of Scottish history, and his dominance in the subject has recently earned him the sobriquet, the big beast of Scottish history. <laughs> Tom, has, Tom has promised us he's going to be explosive tonight. So that's going to be great. Ewan Crawford. Ewan started his career as a journalist in England before joining the BBC and has produced major news programmes including Good Morning Scotland and Newsweek Scotland. Uh, he spent four years uh, between 2000 and 2004 uh, working closely with uh, uh, John Swinney who was then leader of the Scottish National Party and he continues as you know to write for the Scotsman, The Guardian and other newspapers as well as appearing on uh, a number of BBC programmes. He is also a lecturer at the University of the west of Scotland. Welcome. John McAlpin. Um, well, the, the, we're in John's office right now, so it, it's almost invidious of me to, uh, to, to introduce her in that sense, because she's more at home in this place than perhaps uh, I, I am. Uh, obviously, former Scottish Journalist of the Year, editor of the Sunday Times in Scotland, and deputy editor of the Herald. And she's widely known as uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, most important figures in Scottish journalism. Uh, and anyone who read her blog, uh, Go Lassie Go, uh, uh, will see that uh, um, she used the blog to make sure that people, I suspect, really got a chance to look at some of the, the issues in, in, in more detail, but at the same time in a very accessible way. And she does that uh, consistently in her columns in the Daily Record. And she uh, obviously serves as SNP MSP for the South of Scotland and as a member of the Education and Culture Committee, uh, where it says here she has more than once grilled BBC representatives to the bone. I'm not quite sure what that means. Gracious. Thanks, Asashi, but I'm not quite sure what it means. <laughs> okay. Uh, and last but by no means least, Kate Higgins, uh, who uh, is an effective campaigner and fundraiser. At Capability Scotland uh, and on the Civil so Society uh, Media Limited. Uh, Kate is also policy manager for Children First. She again writes for the Herald Scotsman and online blog sites such as Bella Caledonia and National Collective. And I hope you've all had a chance to look at her own blog, which is Bird's Eye View, spelt with a Z. <coughs> uh, and she's an active uh, uh, Twitter, it says here, where she tweets almost every hour. So I hope she's going to take a little bit of time off tonight. <laughs> now, Kate can't be with us for the duration, um, uh, so her place will be filled by uh, Pete Murray of the National Union of Journalists uh, when she needs to leave. And I'd like to also thank our sponsor this evening uh, and ask him to say a few words before we move to the first of our panellists uh, um, uh, this evening, who will be Ian McQuirta. Uh, uh, our sponsor is Patrick Harvey, MSP, uh, leader of the Scottish Green Party. Uh, we're very much indebted to Patrick. Uh, unfortunately, I have to say that none of our distinguished panellists can quite achieve the status that, uh, that Patrick uh, has achieved, where he has been roundly condemned and disparaged in the Daily Mail. Uh, but, uh, so uh, I thank all the panelists for being here, and I thank Patrick for sponsoring this evening. And Patrick, perhaps you could say a few words before we move into the main business. Thanks, John. Um, not just the, the Daily Mail, I was um, the recipient of a complaint on grounds of blasphemy from Donald Trump. Uh, I'm even, <laughs> even more proud of that than I am of the, the, the Daily Mail, uh, Super Kate. Um, can I uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, host the, the evening? It's the uh, easy bit of, of my job is, uh, is just to book a room, and it's a privilege uh, to be able to bring in and welcome uh, external organisations to take part in debates which are relevant to Scottish politics, and I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to have that opportunity. 
way, way, way before I was ever uh, an MSP or even thought there would be such a thing as an MSP, uh, I was a wee boy whose dad came home from work every day at the BBC and who would grumble uh, about what was being done to the organisation and uh, about everything that was being done wrong uh, in his view and still sometimes grumbles about those things uh, in, in a constructive way, of course. So I'm someone who uh, cares very much uh, about broadcasting and uh, although uh, I might not share every uh, view that the current uh, Scottish Government has about the future of broadcasting, it seems to me that the opportunity of the, the debate around the referendum, almost uh, you know, whichever decision the Scottish people make, and I'll, I'll be arguing for a yes vote, but whichever decision the Scottish people make, uh, we have the opportunity to recast uh, our approach to broadcasting in a way that serves the interests of Scottish viewers and listeners uh, and surfers and readers and all of the rest of it uh, much better than they're served at the moment. So I, I look forward to the debate and I'd like to welcome you all here. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, you may recall from our first meeting, which took place a few months ago when we discussed this, uh, a state fit for the 21st century, that the format we will use tonight is very much based upon the question time approach, i.e. that uh, I shall invite each of our distinguished panellists to speak for five or so minutes, uh, and then once they're all through, uh, to invite uh, them to uh, take your questions. So this is a real opportunity uh, for you to participate in the development of this subject uh, and, to, uh, and to examine some of those areas uh, with this distinguished group tonight. Uh, I suspect there probably won't be a better chance uh, than, than there is this evening. So make full use of it, I would suggest. Um, the, um, I, I'd like to call the speakers in the following order, if I may. Uh, I'd like to start with Ian and then John. Uh, uh, and, and then you and, and then Kate, and finish you off with uh, the explosive professor, Tom Devine. So, Ian, can I hand the floor to you? Well, OK, so the, the first uh, question we're meant to address is how good is Scotland's broadcasting at representing uh, Scotland to the world, and how you know, good the Scottish broadcasting is at representing the world to Scotland, because um, obviously in a country which is in a stage of national self-discovery, the broadcast media are tremendously uh, important. It's how the national conversation is conducted. It's how people form, on the whole, form their political uh, attitudes or get, derive their politi political information and therefore their uh, idea of uh, the kind of country that they're living in. Um, I say it's uh, the, the stage of, of broadcasting is better than it was a few years ago. It's still far worse than it could be or should be. I maybe don't entirely subscribe to uh, Tom Devine's view that it's a uh, basically as an insult to Scotland, the, the BBC. Uh, it has been uh, certainly letting the country down in many respects, not least in terms of the amount of broadcasting uh, of, of uh, network commissions that uh, were being made. That's the amount of money that goes into the broadcast media in Scotland. And as a result of the uh, setting up of the Scottish, the Scottish Broadcasting Commission in 2007, which made some very trenchant criticisms of the way the BBC behaved, there were a number of important changes made. So the number of network commissions by value has increased very substantially, about uh, three times, I think, what it was. It's now about 9% uh, per capita, whereas it was about 3% uh, before. And that is, uh, is quite a significant change. But it hasn't altered the fundamental problem with broadcasting in Scotland, with the, with the BBC in Scotland, which is essentially it's not tooled up to be a national broadcaster. The idea is it's meant to be local broadcasting, and it's funded in that, uh, uh, from that point of view. Um, it's sort of encapsulated in the way they used to describe the kind of mission statement of uh, the politics show on the BBC, that it was from Downing Street to your street. So the Downing Street bit is the bit that comes from London, and the Ure Street is the bit that you get locally uh, from your local station. Now, people in BBC Scotland, uh, as you and I'm sure will confirm, have gone to extraordinary lengths in, in recent years to manage to make something out of the very minimal resources that they have to try to make something which uh, credibly sounds like uh, a national broadcasting uh, organization, but it's nothing uh, obviously like that. You can tell that in the extent to, to which the, the funding is different north of the border for comparable programs. I mean, as, uh, as you were saying, I, I worked for the BBC for 27 years, and I worked for a large part of it in Westminster, presenting programs like Westminster Live, 
and then coming to Scotland in 1999 and presenting exactly the same programmes here. And the staffing was totally different. I mean, there was about a quarter of the staff uh, and about a quarter of the budget that was uh, allocated to the comparable programmes uh, in Westminster. And when I sort of raised this with BBC executives and said that, you know, there doesn't seem to be any, any reason why broadcasting from the Scottish Parliament should be funded at a different level from Westminster. I was always told, well, you've got to remember that Scotland has only a tenth of the population, so you can only really expect, expect a tenth of the budget. And that never seemed to me a very credible um, argument. But it's one which is, is, is very pervasive in the BBC. Um, the, the fund, they, do not, they don't have a sense of benchmark funding. In other words, they don't say that um, political broadcasting or current affairs broadcasting should be done at a certain level, whether it's in Scotland or whether it's uh, in England. So you're always going to get this um, uh, impression that uh, it is a kind of hand-me-down, north of the border kind of threadbare. So um, what's going to happen? If, if broadcasting was devolved to the Scottish Parliament, I think it almost certainly will be, almost whatever happens now, because there's going to be another round of uh, devolution of, of various powers under devolution plus, devolution max, uh, and obviously if there's Scotland votes for independence, then there will be the setting up of a Scottish broadcasting uh, uh, service, an SBC. I mean, I don't think that's going to be, that would be that much different actually from what we're seeing uh, at the moment. If it, was brought, if it was simply devolved to the Scottish Parliament, um, again, it wouldn't be a huge difference, but I think it would be a significant difference because at least um, the committees of the Scottish Parliament would be able to, to call the BBC executives on a more regular basis because they would have uh, a degree of oversight. Now, um, oversight does not mean political, con political control. Uh, if, if the Scottish Parliament had responsibility for broadcasting at the moment it's reserved exclusively for Westminster, it wouldn't mean that uh, Alex Salmon was setting the running order of the six o'clock news. But it would be a significant difference and you would find the BBC executives would have to justify themselves to a democratic forum. And it's, uh, you know, it's important to, uh, when, we, when Joan and her committee had uh, representatives of the BBC, I think you had Mark Thompson up here, didn't you, and gave him a bit of a hard time. I mean, that, they do notice, they take note of these things, and you will find that things do change as a result of that. So political oversight has... Uh, has a significant role uh, to play, even though it doesn't involve itself in any sense in uh, editorial matters. But there is a bizarre thing, which is that um, the way things are standing, you could conceivably have uh, a Levinson-style press regulator north of the border, because the press is not reserved to Westminster, but not broadcasting uh, north of the border. I think that would be a very curious uh, anomaly and I think that's why I'm pretty sure as a result of the Leveson process and as a result of the attempts to, if, if only to head off uh, independence north of the border, that there will be broadcasting, will be devolved to the Scottish Parliament in fairly short order. So I don't think things are too bad. There's a bit more money going to broadcasting in Scotland. Um, it's doing its best with very limited resources. Um, it's losing a lot of staff just now. It's very unfortunate the BBC is doing that on the eve of... Uh, the independence referendum, but uh, it's subject to financial constraints, which it's not really able to avoid. And I'd have to say, finally, coming from uh, the newspaper world, which is in a state of uh, extreme uh, distress at the moment, and that there's a real possibility of the Scottish press almost ceasing to exist as far as the so-called Scottish quality press is concerned. So I'd have to say, looking at it from that point of view, then, you know, so the, the broadcasting environment is not that bad, and perhaps we should be thankful for small mercies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. <clears throat> if I can ask Joan now. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I w wish I shared, uh, shared Ian's optimism um, about uh, the state of broadcasting. I know that perhaps that's over-egging it, but uh, certainly from the evidence that we took at committee, uh, Stuart Maxwell, the convener of the committee, is here, um, uh, didn't really give us a great deal of encouragement, in particularly in terms of the BBC, um, who until very recently uh, the management was refusing to come uh, and explain itself to the committee, and it was only by writing to Lord Payton uh, recently that today uh, we were able to say that he had asked them to reverse their decision and. Uh, 
the management are now going to come and speak to the committee. But um, some of the stuff that came out when um, Pete Murray, uh, who's here today as well, uh, and his colleague from Beck to were giving uh, evidence to the committee um, was really of great concern in that BBC Scotland's money is being cut uh, uh, by 20%, so it's 102 uh, million just now, and it's going to be cut by to 86 million, and that's in cash terms, uh, not not real terms, between now and 2018. So it's very very substantial, and that's at a time when we should be having a national conversation about the constitutional future of the country. Um, if if BBC Scotland was uh, in a position to already be producing the kind of quality uh, programmes uh, that you, you see in the rest of the network, perhaps uh, get, taking its fair share, which is the argument that they were uh, making to us, uh, would be reasonable. But um, as, as Ian has outlined, the, the benchmarking, despite the best efforts of the many talented people that work for BBC Scotland, the, the benchmarking is... Uh, is absolutely appalling, and that actually that affects the the kinds of uh, debates that you're, you're able to have now. When BBC management came in front of the committee uh, in in May, Mark Thompson actually refused to say how much money was spent on uh, Good Morning Scotland as compared to the Today Day programme. Um, he said that was a, a matter of uh, confidentiality; that somehow it would compromise them as a commercial. As a competitor with commercial organisations, but I just don't think that has any credibility whatsoever. Um, but I was grateful to Pete when he came before the committee a few weeks ago for the NUJ, who, um, because of uh, their internal knowledge, uh, was able to give us at least some kind of idea of, of the way the resources stack up. Now, if you look at the uh, the lunchtime uh, program on the BBC. Um, uh, on, on the radio, Johnny Beatty's programme has two producers and one assistant producer. Uh, the equivalent in London, the World at One, has two editors, two senior producers, four junior producers, and, and one assistant. Uh, and uh, obviously, they'll, they'll have uh, they'll have more input in terms of presenters as well. Now. I think that comes out very, very clearly, no matter how the quality uh, of the people who are working on it. I think that comes out very clearly in, in the kind of way that they discuss things. And I know that the um, bias is mentioned in the title to this. And after watching uh, Ian Davison on, on Newsnight, I'm not going to get into any accusations of politicians accusing journalists of bias because it just it was just so cringeworthy. However, I think you know lack of resources in a big uh, UK-wide organisation like the BBC does actually affect the way that you cover stories. And uh, just one example from that Johnny Beatty show a while ago, which really, really struck me when I, I listened to the, sh the show while driving up from the south of Scotland. Um, the living wage had been upgraded um, that week. And uh, so there was a big discussion about the living wage. Now, this is a good example because it's, it's a non-political example. You know, I could say, well, you know, the this SNP government are implementing the, the living wage in Scotland, but you could also say from a Scottish, you could look at it from a Scottish point of view, um, that uh, we had a Labour member, uh, John Park, who was putting a private member's bill forward in this parliament dis discussing the living wage. And you could also look at what lo Scottish local authorities were doing. Like, for example, Glasgow claimed to be the first local authority to, uh, to introduce it. But none of that was covered in this very long uh, discussion about the living wage on the Johnny Beatty show because they went straight to the Westminster correspondent. They had stuff from Boris Johnson uh, in London and they had, they had stuff from Westminster, and uh, they didn't pay any attention at all to what was happening in Scotland, which is absolutely extraordinary from a, a point of view that it was the, the sort of flagship lunchtime bulletin. Uh, I don't think that was because of a, an inherent bias on the part of the journalists. I just think that was because their news gathering uh, abilities are extremely limited, and to, to, to do it in Scotland, you'd actually have to go out and and, and conduct the interviews uh, yourself. Um, it's similar in this, the same program. Uh, I think this was a, a good example as well of uh, of uh, how the restriction operates. Um, they had someone had been mentioning uh, this, a reader had a listener had got in touch to talk about 
uh, coming back from Canada after 20 years and noticing a decline in Scottish brands. And this had produced a lot of tweets and, and uh, emails from readers of reminiscing about Scottish brands. Uh, and the response of the programme's producer was to go to a professor dealing with brands in London, who then, and then they had quite a long interview with him talking about, about British brands, uh, because they didn't actually have the research capability to go out and find somebody to speak about it in the Scottish context. Um, uh, that's just one example. I could dream of lots, lots of others, and I don't want to be ha hammering all the time at the BBC. It's just an example of how... Um, how a decline in, uh, in income uh, can affect actually the, the content that, that you put out. And uh, I think this is particularly marked, uh, Ian mentioned the, the decline in Scottish print media recently. If you look at when uh, we saw so the rise of television, if you look at how media was delivered in Scotland, to say, round about, say, 60 years ago, when the, the coronation, when a lot of people bought televisions, uh, there, was a, there was a huge indigenous Scottish media, but it was publishing and it was newspapers, and uh, people were able to exchange ideas and talk about their country and their culture um, uh, amongst themselves and to the world. Uh, now, all those, uh, the publishers, the newspapers, they have all gone into decline. I'm not just talking about the national newspapers, I'm talking about local newspapers, um, you know, which used to be, uh, you know, very, very lively uh, uh, opportunities to debate politics as well. So they've all gone into decline. So the broadcasting is even more important, and obviously the BBC as the as a public service broadcaster is particularly important. In the last 15 years, you've seen the BBC respond very well in a national and international sense to the changes in media, um, and that we've now got new channels. We've got BBC Three, BBC Four, you've got Five Live, you've got all different platforms where they deliver news and current affairs and uh, drama to different audiences in different ways. And in Scotland, it stayed the same. We haven't, we haven't been able to respond in the same way. And as a, as a smaller country within a, a, a larger culture in the UK, I think it's, you can say that they've produced more content, if, but if it's scattered around, um, there is actually no way where you can have that national conversation. And that's why I think the Scottish Digital uh, Network was so important, why it was so important that we got cross-party support. Um, for the digital network when it was uh, discussed in the Parliament. And if I could just say, just to finish off what, what one last thing, um, is that I think it's really important that it doesn't become a party uh, political issue um, caught up in this, just in the constitutional debate. Because whatever your position is on the constitution, I think that Scotland as a nation ought to be able to talk to itself and project itself to the world. And what I'm concerned about is that, um, is that efforts to improve broadcasting in Scotland and improve the way we share information uh, will be stymied by people taking party political decisions because they feel that um, expressions of Scottish culture somehow drive people down, down a particular route and I think that would be a shame.